This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. The social history of people with disabilities and people who represent uh, ethno-linguistic minorities is uh, very tangled in the United States and, uh, and has large unhappy pieces to it. And the reasons are easily understood that uh, it used to be part of the calumny against uh, ethnic minorities that they were uh, not very smart, that they in fact uh, suffered from intellectual deficiencies. And on the other hand, individuals with disabilities have long been treated as second-class citizens. So the tangle came from the fact that neither group and their advocates wanted to be associated with the other group. And uh, that means that when we talk about disabilities uh, and in the same breath talk about uh, linguistic and ethnic minorities, um, that arouses a lot of feelings in people who have strong emotions about these things, so uh, I want to set those aside, I set those sort of socially induced concerns aside for a second, and let's just try to talk about uh, both the sociology, the, the cognitive science, and maybe a little bit of the neuroscience associated with uh, children that have a extreme difficulty learning how to read. So I, I want to propose just for our discussion today that that there are common cognitive problems and instructional solutions that may address both the innate learning disabilities uh, uh, of children that that have uh, learning disabilities, dyslexia, and uh, the problems that uh, learning to learn in English as a second language pose for many children who are second language learners. Now I'm going to make the point that. Uh, our population of second language learners in the United States is confounded with uh, income class. So if you look at second language learners in Canada, for example, uh, past their first years in school, they tend to catch up with their peers and they tend to do quite well, uh, somewhat indistinguishable from uh, the native Canadians. Well, but that's not the case in the United States, and, and the reason is not because uh, Canadian teaching is so much better than American teaching, it's, it's because uh, our population in the United States tends to be, um, tends to be uh, uh, largely uh, lower social income classes, and we have, there's a long history in science that associates the effects of poverty and uh, educational outcomes. So if you look on the left-hand side here, you see um, you know, some of the sort of the defining features of learning disabilities as we, as we currently think about them. And the, the two main things is that there's a presumed innate neurodevelopmental factor that underlies uh, the disability and that it, it, it manifests itself in, in difficulty in learning uh, sort of basic kinds of language skills and manipulations. And that these children also present as what uh, we might call treatment resistors. That is, if you think of education teaching as the treatment, that they tend to be poorly responsive to the core instruction that is provided in classrooms. And uh, just as, just as uh, every uh, teacher of English language learner, learners knows that every, every lesson, no matter what the content, is really about English then uh, for children who have learning disabilities, every lesson is about uh, learning and the use of language in learning. So it doesn't matter what the content is, that if they have language-related difficulties, language processing difficulties, they're going to have problems in all areas. On the other side, you see uh, what seems to be the defining features of the current consensus about children who are English language learners that their underachievement is presumed to be the result of an adequate educational opportunity or instruction. 
And uh, I included that uh, claims that um, uh, cultural, instilling cultural considerations into instruction would improve the outcomes for children with who are English language learners, and, and that certainly may be true. But in 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 general, the, the cases that uh, their underachievement is thought to be related to just inadequate instruction, <clears throat> and they also are uh, sometimes considered treatment resistors in the sense that core instruction seems not to be sufficient to uh, eliminate or overcome whatever the uh, achievement barriers are that they face. So what I'm going to propose here is that we could sort of, we could exchange these, uh, these explanations of factors so that you could just as easily say about children with learning disabilities that they also have had inadequate educational opportunity or instruction, and inadequate given their cognitive circumstances. And you could say similarly about English language learners that they also have innate neurodevelopmental factors, not deficiencies, but there are innate neurodevelopment factors that underlie their response to inadequate educational opportunity instruction. So it makes us at least consider uh, for the practical purposes of uh, identification and instruction whether we're really uh, making uh, a distinction between the populations for sociological reasons or political reasons or whether there really is some psychological good sense in thinking that way. The general research uh, and treatment assumptions for children with learning disabilities are that they require an individualized cognitive assessment because the, the etiology of their disability is presumed to be uh, neurocognitive in nature, and that the treatment is individually tailored in principle, but in practice, uh, teachers, uh, both in special education and general education, tend to teach children um, as groups. General effectiveness of uh, direct and specific extensive in and intensive instruction is, is clearly been shown to be effective, not only with children with learning disabilities, you see here there's a reported effect size of uh, about one standard deviation. But, um, but, it's been, but this kind of instruction has proved to be effective with children who, uh, whose underachievement is uh, presumed to be related to their impoverished circumstances as well. Uh, and adding individually designed strategy and cognitive self-regulation training uh, can get, uh, creates the possibility of, um, of effect sizes that are even larger. In English language learners, we think about this as requiring some kind of individualized language skills assessment and the treatment is group tailored, although tailored skills may vary from individual to individual. Now, it isn't so sensible when you think about children who are learning how to uh, 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 operate in a, in a second language that their individual differences somehow take a back seat to their group similarities. The fact that all the children are uh, in the same predicament of trying to learn English so that they can uh, achieve in uh, subject matter is uh, not sufficient reason to think that you should uh, avoid the individual differences that present themselves with the children. So, so part, part of the reason that we, we sort of go wrong when we think of uh, langu uh, language uh, education for children who are second language learners is that we tend to think in these terms that they're the, the fact of their inability to speak English prov provides a sufficient common basis for instructing them and that the individual differences that they present with are not so consequential. Well, it could, it could be that that's not the case at all. And, uh, and all I have to do is point to the fact that all children who are English language learners uh, don't, don't experience the same amount of difficulty in acquiring English or functioning in English. So there's controversy about the fundamental importance of basing instruction on cultural principles. Uh, this is not to take argument with, uh, with, uh, with arguments about equity and arguments about fair access or uh, equality of opportunity or respect for culture and language uh, background, but it, but it isn't clear that we have good data to show that um, that instruction based upon that principle or based upon those principles is effective. And the, the research tends to show that when you provide, uh, in general, what is called bilingual instruction, which is no longer permitted in California, uh, the effect size is only about a third of the standard deviation. And, and the term bilingual education covers a host of variations. 
uh, across uh, classrooms and uh, edu educational circumstances. So this is uh, the circumstance we find ourselves in in California. These are the, uh, uh, the uh, academic progress index for uh, children who are uh, English learners, students with disabilities, and children who are considered socially, socio socioeconomically disadvantaged from 2005 to 2011. So th the first thing you can see here is that, um, that the children who are classified as English learners by the state of California and those who are classified as socioeconomically disadvantaged don't look really very different from each other. And, uh, and, and both of those groups uh, perform significantly better than uh, children who are considered disabled. Now understand that the classification of children as English, as English learners or as socioeconomically disadvantaged disguises all the individual variations that may be important in instruction. Uh, likewise, uh, all the children that are considered uh, disabled uh, also ex uh, are variable in their outcomes and performances and responsiveness. And so uh, this only gives us a very gross idea about what the differences are. So you should not take the categorical argument very seriously. You shouldn't be thinking, oh, if I can categorize the child as this, this is where I expect them to perform. Uh, when children walk into the classroom, you have to greet them one at a time as they come in. You can't, they, they don't represent their class when they come in. So let's look at reading. Back in 2000, um, we wanted to settle the reading argument once and for all. It uh, didn't work, of course, but, but we tried. And uh, a national reading panel said, uh, quality instruction, effective instruction, instruction that had effective outcomes, uh, should have a, at least these five components to them. And the first of these was phonemic awareness. That's the ability to, to uh, hear, identify, and play with individual sounds or phonemes in spoken words. I wouldn't have said it quite that way. But, but from a, from a neuro-linguistic perspective, it's quite a complicated achievement to be able to uh, live in a language community and recognize that the stream of sound that you hear when people speak actually uh, has a rule structure to it so that it's composed of some smaller set of sounds that have only a psychological reality. Remember, there's no acoustical reality. There's no physical reality to phonemes. Uh, if you take a... Well, we don't have tape recorders anymore, but if you had a tape recorder and you tried to sort of take the word uh, cat and sort of clip, clip the tape smaller and smaller to try to find where the C is and where the A is, where the T is, you could never find it because they don't exist in reality. They don't exist in physical reality. These are, these are psychological categories that uh, children in every language community learn and they learn how to distinguish some broad class of actual sounds as phonemes, and different languages have different phonemes. So uh, it, it, it is uh, probably one of the big breakthroughs in the 1980s that, uh, that children that perform poorly in tasks that require that they understand uh, this, this phonemic structure to language are at a distinct disadvantage if they can't uh, perform these mental manipulations of phonemes. And uh, this, this turns out to be true even in languages that are not alphabetic. So even in Chinese, there are children, because of individual differences, who process phonemes uh, not as adequately as children, uh, as other children, and they're, and they're reading in Chinese, which is an ideographic language, not an alphabetic language, is affected by that fact. So what we know is this, that some children learn how to read effortlessly. And uh, others, e they learn easily no matter what method of instruction is used. So this is probably what's led to the, the great war that we've had since uh, the 1950s about whether we should have uh, one kind of instruction or another, because most children who are normal learners um, uh, will learn under whatever method you use. And it's uh, a testimony to the flexibility of, of our uh, cognitive system that it's, it's compensatory. So if you teach children one way, that you, a normally developing child will use whatever information you provide to develop uh, language skills. And if uh, you take the same child and transplant them to another place and teach them a different way, they'll, they'll do the same thing. About 30% of children, though, struggle to learn how to read. 
And it's about equal for boys and girls, even though boys seem to show up more in the roles of children in special education. About 50% of all the students receiving special education are classified as learning disabled, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Among, uh, among children who are uh, identified as learning disabled in the United States, um, children who are uh, Hispanic and therefore have some Spanish-speaking background in their families at home, uh, are identified at a much higher rate than children who are from other groups. Now, most, most children that have reading problems that we think of as being related to learning disabilities have problems at the word level of processing. So we think about reading as having two levels of processing, a word level, which is you see the word, you puzzle out what uh, phonemes in the language are being represented, and the phonemes give you a kind of a clue to what the word may be, and you search your memory to find out if you've ever heard that word before and know what it means, and, uh, um, and then you move on in the sentence. But there's also a level of processing that's related to the text as a whole, a, a, a kind of reasoning ability that's much more complex that has to do with reasoning about the information that's in the text and being constrained in some way by the information that's in the text. So children who have learning disabilities uh, don't do as poorly as everybody imagines they do at the comprehension level because they make use of every possible clue that they can find in and around the text. And they, and they are generally considered to be normally intelligence, so they, they bring all their resources to bear on trying to understand what the text is saying. Where they really get slowed down, though, is trying to deal with those individual words. So the, the standard model of reading wa was that if you acquire great fluency at the level of individual words, that it will follow naturally for you to become better at comprehending. And that's not necessarily the case. But but it is the case that it may not be a sufficient condition for you to become a good reader. It is a necessary condition. So <clears throat> here's uh, some work that was done by uh, the Fuchses back in 2005. And it shows um, the difference in uh, growth over time uh, by children who uh, have, show very low risk at early screening. That is, if you look at their abilities to do phonemic tasks, they uh, show no risk, and you see that their growth in reading is, um, is normal. That is, for a year in school, they have about a year's worth of equivalent growth. Uh, children who are screened as being at high risk because of their poor phonemic performance early in uh, school uh, do comparably less well. So the evidence has converged that, that our most valid and reliable predictors of risk for reading are print concepts, that is, knowing the letter names, uh, early in kindergarten or even in preschool, uh, phonological awareness about letter sounds, and then uh, the rapid naming of letters, the ability to, uh, to remember and recall the names of letters very quickly, and then word recognition beyond that. Now let's talk about English learners for a moment, and then we'll see how they sort of fit together. Uh, <clears throat> from, the, um, from the Preventing Reading Difficulties in Young Children report, uh, we had these conclusions, that low English proficiency in Spanish-speaking English learners is a strong indication that the child is at risk for reading difficulty. Low English proficiency in Spanish-speaking English learners. So that needs to be qualified somewhat because it depends, uh, obviously, on how much exposure the child has had to instruction and what age of a child we're talking about. I'm going to tell you about a study that we did uh, um, about 10 years ago that uh, involved kindergartners who came to school who knew very little English. And their circumstances uh, are quite different from somebody who is a newcomer who comes like in fifth grade and has already had four years of uh, education and reading somewhere else. Low reading achievement is a widespread problem among Latino uh, students even when they're instructed and tested in Spanish. However, that, doesn't, that, doesn't, that generalization doesn't work when we talk about Latino students in Canada. And as I said earlier, the reason for that is not likely to be that the schools in Canada and the teachers are so much better than, than teachers in schools in the United States. The difference probably is 
that they represent a, uh, uh, a much more normalized uh, distribution of income classes in, Ch in Canada than they do in the United States. So in other words, uh, Canadians have a very strict immigration policy which uh, um, requires that you show uh, uh, evidence of education or employment before you can, uh, you can, um, uh, you can emigrate to Canada. Uh, United States uh, immigration is uh, not as well controlled, and so you have people who are uh, looking for life opportunities and uh, employment opportunities who come across the border, and they often don't have very much education or uh, or academic skills, which is part of the reason why it's difficult for them to find employment at home, and it's one of the reasons why they come to the United States. So the population of children that that Snow and her colleagues were writing about here are not really equivalent across national borders. Linguistic differences are not solely responsible for this high degree of risk, and that's what I was just alluding to, and the role of uh, co-occurring group risk factors, and here they recognize that school quality, home literacy, and socioeconomic status has to be considered. Well, also we know that the schools that children go to are not uh, orthogonal to their social status, that uh, schools in the United States are neighborhood schools, so they represent the socioeconomics of the neighborhood. So to develop second language literacy, instruction is a key component of reading, as it would be in first language literacy. Instruction in key components is necessary, that is those five components that the National Reading Panel uh, pulled out are the same. Uh, when I was making this, uh, these kind of comments in our conference once, uh, someone in the audience took exception and said, well, you know, uh, when you learn how to read in Spanish, uh, you don't learn to do uh, phonetic decoding. You read by syllable. And not only that, the orthography in Spanish is considered transparent. That is, it maps to uh, phonemes uh, highly, very reliably so that children learn how to read totally differently if they're learning how to read back home in a Spanish-speaking country. Well, that's absolutely true. But it doesn't apply to learning how to read English, because English is not uh, transparent orthography. It's a very opaque orthography. And um, if the children come with families who are themselves not very well educated, they don't get, uh, they don't get as much uh, leverage from their family's education as children who are uh, in higher income classes regardless of family background. Individual differences uh, contribute significantly. Well, this is the point that I'm making earlier, is that we, we get all caught up about thinking about these categories as if children who are English learners are represent some homogenous category of child. They don't. Uh, but just as, just as truly, children who are considered learning disabil uh, disabled are also not all that homogenous either. So, so we need to stop thinking about those things and start thinking about um, what are the functional realities about development and language acquisition for children based upon individual differences. Most assessments poorly estimate individual strengths and weaknesses. In California, the, uh, the system that we use in the schools uh, to assign children uh, status as English learners or as um, uh, English, uh, English, uh, English proficient uh, learners is, uh, is without much validity and it has almost no reliability at all. It doesn't correlate with any reading outcomes that are important. So uh, we make all kinds of decisions about uh, placing children in instructional settings based upon how we've assessed their first language, and we're, and we're almost always doing, uh, engaged in an exercise that has no consequence at all educationally. Little evidence related to sociocultural variables and literacy achievement or development or home language experiences. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's little evidence that relates sociocultural variables on literacy achievement, but home language experiences can have an impact, positive impact. And one of our projects uh, with Spanish-speaking kindergartners, uh, some mothers came to us and asked if we could help them because they wanted their children to do well in learning how to speak English and to read in English. And they said that they didn't know how to do that because they themselves did not speak English and they themselves were not literate. And they were afraid, in, at least in the case of one mother, they were afraid to speak to their child in Spanish out of fear that somehow that was going to interfere with their child child's acquisition of English skills. So we quickly disabused her of that idea, and we, we met with the parents and showed them how they could sit and have 
normal conversational interactions with their children over uh, read material that their child was learning how to read and that the parents had wealth of knowledge and uh, experience that they could bring to bear that would enrich the children's vocabulary, their, uh, their concepts, and uh, their family cultural history. Uh, this is the things that um, have been called cultural capital, and uh, these mothers didn't think they had any, so we tried to show them that they actually did, and that not only was it going to be a good child-mother experience, but they actually would be helping their child learn language skills that would transfer to, to English. So language minority learners who enter kindergarten and, and are fluent in English at the time they enter kindergarten catch up with their native English speakers uh, by first grade and, and maintain nationally average letters uh, levels throughout, throughout uh, through eighth grade. But language minority learners with initially limited English proficiency demonstrated um, English reading trajectories that are substantially below national averages, as I showed you from the California data, but converge with those of peers from similar socioeconomic backgrounds, which was in that first graph I showed you. So here's a study that was done by uh, one of our UC professors that are involved in this UC-wide center that uh, uh, Robin was mentioning, uh, Rolando Connor down at UC Riverside. She's just done this massive uh, three-year project. Uh, working in Riverside uh, schools, and Riverside County schools. Uh, so here's, here's what she found after working with these kids for quite a long while. That earlier intervention produced significantly better outcomes than the same interventions begun later in kindergarten. Well, that makes sense. Similar rates of growth between students who were English only or English learners. That is, uh, it didn't matter what their official school status was about their English proficiency that they learned at similar rates. Twice as many students in the, uh, in the immediate as in the delayed treatment scored in the average range at the end of the year. Well, that, that sort of fits with the idea about proficiency early on. If, you're, if you tend to be proficient early on, you tend to do better. Pre-test did not predict good or poor responders to treatment. So testing the children early on did not tell them who was going to respond to instruction. By January, letter knowledge and phonemic awareness were reliably better for good versus poor responders. So that's what really made the difference between the children that responded well to instruction was their ability to have letter knowledge and phonemic awareness. So this is, uh, this is California uh, and data and data from my project um, that we began back in 2000. So let me tell you just a little bit about this. Uh, we had about 376 children, uh, almost all of whom were English language learners, almost all of whom had family languages in Spanish. And um, the, um, the red line here represents the uh, uh, eight years of data that uh, uh, we have now. We actually uh, work with these children only for the first three years, kindergarten, first, and second grade. And then uh, we found them again when they entered high school. And we went back and we got all of their California achievement uh, test data from the years that we were not in contact with them. So that's what that red line represents. Um, the blue line uh, represents uh, how California students generally performed over uh, the last five years, or six years. and. Uh, and the uh, green line represents how children who are classified as English learners, classified as English learners, in uh, the same school district where we had been working with these children, how they performed over the same period of time. So before I show you what we did with them, let me, let me take a step sideways and, uh, and show you uh, something about the instructional method that we used because it bears on the problem of uh, similarities and differences between these populations. We call this, uh, this model a core intervention model. And it's based upon, uh, it's a collection of uh, pieces that uh, we quilted together from various sources. Its theoretical origin comes from what's called cognitive load theory. Uh, cognitive load refers to the demand that, that an academic response places on uh, both structural and processing limitations that children have. All children have some structural and processing limitations. Uh, you cannot attend to uh, uh, many things at the same time. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, hold 
uh, information in your memory for very long periods of time without doing something with it. And everybody has those, lim those processing limitations. Some people are much more efficient at using that system than others. Um, but every child comes to school with some individual configuration of those limitations. Specifically, uh, we're going to be interested here in the working memory system which has certain constraints in, th in that capacity is generally created only by greater efficiency. So you have a certain, um, you have a certain ability, it's, uh, think of it as a sort of a bucket of a certain size, but you can fill it and empty it at different rates. And uh, really skilled children can fill it and empty it really quickly and children who are not so skilled uh, or have other, or other kinds of constraining characteristics uh, are very slow at filling it and very slow at emptying it. And not only that, the bucket's got holes in it. So um, it's very difficult for them to uh, perform fast enough on some kinds of processing tasks to uh, be able to um, learn uh, normal reading skills and other kinds of skills without uh, considerable more instructional effort. So efficiency in turn develops as a product of natural maturation. So, so efficiency comes just from being in the environment using language and experience, including uh, you know, you're growing up in a family where people, people chat with each other. We know for uh, many years now that the uh, vocabulary size of children who are entering school is uh, markedly smaller in children who come from homes that are uh, impoverished compared to children who are raised in homes that are middle class homes. And also instruction. So instruction actually matters here. Now this is, a, this is a, an old map of uh, what was taken to be a working memory system, uh, first proposed by uh, Badley uh, so many years ago now. This, this particular uh, chart came from a more recent article when he was revising his model, but it's a very simple uh, kind of system, and it's based upon uh, based upon experimental results. So there's no neurology involved in this. There's no uh, brain imaging involved. This is just uh, years and years of behavioral studies where uh, the the best explanation for that behavioral data comes from a model that looks like this. And uh, in, in this working memory model, you have uh, two major features. You have something that is, that is, that is designed by evolution to handle uh, phonological information. Uh, that's something that has evolved in us as a species. It's not, it's not a skill that has to be developed. It's, it's a hardwired part of uh, the cognitive system. And as you will see, it's probably also a hardwired part of the actual physical brain, too. And that um, there's, a, there's a separate system that is a visual, which he called a visual spatial sketch pad, which, is a, which performs a similar function. It, these are both uh, systems that hold information of the two different types for very short periods of time while uh, you're deciding whether or not this memory, w whether this information needs to be placed in some kind of long-term storage or whether you need to use it in order to uh, solve some sort of problem. Both of these systems are considered slave systems. In other words, they don't operate on their own. They're being controlled. And uh, the controlling mechanism he, he called the central executive. So you can't increase the amount of capacity you have, but you can do things more efficiently, as I said. So one of the things that saves you a great deal of time is if you can, is if you can represent phonological information very rapidly. If you have uh, built-in codes, codes that you've learned for, let's say, the first sound that you hear in the word cat, if you can identify that, uh, which constitutes a sort of a coding scheme, if you can identify that really quickly and that code is stable, then that makes it easier for you to deal with the rest of the sounds in the word and also makes you uh, a little more efficient at searching your memory for a little furry creature with whiskers. So we developed, based upon that idea, we, we developed an intervention that borrowed from uh, some sources that you'll recognize from direct instruction, uh, developed at the University of Oregon almost 50 years ago, uh, from <coughs> systems of least prompts, which, are, which is used regularly in behavioral therapies. The, the concept here is that we, um, 
We want the child to be able to um, solve the problem and be correct. And we want to be able to appropriately reinforce the child for correct responses. But we also want to be able to control the cognitive load that is associated with the responding. So the first thing that we ask uh, the child is um, what's called a generator supply question. The generator supply question represents the level of performance that persuades you that the child understands the underlying uh, concept or the underlying uh, instructional target. I mean, if I want the child to read the word cat, the supply question is the exact performance that we take as the criterion of proficiency. So we might show the child the word cat and say, uh, you know, what is this word? So the child has to be able to perform all the cognitive functions necessary to be able to respond. That's, that word says cat. If the child doesn't get it correct, we step down this staircase by re reducing the load and turning the problem into a uh, problem of uh, recognition rather than recall. Recall requires the use of this uh, heavy use of the short-term memory system, this working memory system, whereas recognition does not. So now we might say to the child, um, is this word cat or cut? And uh, that, would be a, that would be a fairly difficult discrimination for the child. But we can make the discrimination very broad, too, so that the child's chances, whether we stack the, child, stack the cards in the child's favor, we say, does this word say cat or hippopotamus? So the child's likely to say, what, are you kidding? I can't be hippopotamus. Now, first of all, hippopotamus is a big word, and that's a little word, so it must be cat. So if the child says cat, we say, yeah, good job, that's right. And then we go back up to the supply question. We say, so what is this word? So the child says, what, are you dumb? You just told me the word was cat. So it still must be cat, so it's cat. And then we say, yeah, that's right, that's good. If the child gets it wrong, then we, we go to a, a model lead, a lead step. The model lead step is just as it sounds. The, uh, the instructor models the exact response and then leads the child in providing that response. So you have the whole complex response, whatever it may be, modeled for the child, and the child has a chance to imitate that model. Uh, so you would say something like, this word says cat. What does this word say? So the child just heard you say, this word is cat. So the child models that, this word, uh, imitates that, this word is cat. If they get it right, they're told how bright they are, and they go back up to the binary step. So if you walk down the staircase, you have to walk back up the staircase. So they go to the binary step, and the binary step says, well, is this word cat or cut? The child remembers now that they said cat, and they're looking at it, and they say, well, it's cat. That's right. Good job. What is this word? It's cat. It's still cat. Yes, that's right. If the child misses it at the model lead step, then we go down to a very simple imitation, which reduces the cognitive load to as low as possible. And we say, say cat. And the child says cat. So it's the simplest possible imitation, the simplest, uh, the, the lightest amount of cognitive load that we can uh, impose that will provide that answer. So let me show you um, an example of this being used in practice. Uh, you're going to see uh, uh, Dr. Alexis Filippini, who is the director of the, um, the Mission Learning Center in San Francisco. She's teaching these children, uh, as English learners, the word frightened. Two words. One. Okay. All right. What well, do you have to talk about? Oh, that's the title. What is the scary man doing in this picture? Let me say Show, show the picture. You're right. And what's the big word we learned for scary? Is it fright? Is it frightens? Or snuggles? See it Frightened. Oh, good. What's our new word? Snuggles. 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 Is it frightened? Frightened. Good. What is it? Good. So tell me what the word is, Jeanette. And tell me what frightens means, Cielo. Yeah. So first of all, she establishes uh, the concept, which is by using a known synonym. She says to them, what is that scary man doing in this picture? So she, by using scary, she's working towards uh, a meaning for frightened, but so she's showing them a word that, that they know, using a word that they know already. 
She uses a hand signal to focus their attention and to prepare them for a response. So she doesn't drop her hand until she really wants them to respond. And, and she surprises the person she, she calls on so that they don't know who's going to be called on. And she uses the hand signal also to give them some think time, too. So she surprises them with the selection. She reinforces the correct response. Uh, and she continues without a delay. So when the child gets it right, she says, you're right. And then she builds from the known concept, scary, to the new word, frightened. She says, what's the big word we learned for scared? She does her behavior management while she's teaching. So the hand signals and the visual monitoring, surprise turns, taking uh, and moving distracting objects, moving at a rapid pace, all serves to hold children's attention. She says, is it frightened or is it snuggles? So here she's using that binary choice step where she's um, uh, emphasizing for them, highlighting for them, uh, and prompting them for the word frightened. So she gives a delay here, which is the think time, and she provides a little drama so they don't know who she's going to call on. The student says frightened. She reinforces the correct response. Oh, good. Quick follow-up with the same question to another student in the, in the group. The student thinks the answer is snuggles. So now she does this imitation modeling step, or at least Alexis's version of it, and she says, is it frightened? And the child uh, doesn't say anything, and so she, she quickly, re oh, the child does say something, and she, say, she quickly repeats it. She says, what is it? So she's back up now to the, the supply step, supply question. And then she moves on to a definitional question. Who knows what frightened means? And that's the part of which we cut the tape. Uh, so what, the question, what this question sequence accomplished, it established that students know the concept. It links new word uh, to known word. It helps students recognize the correct word. It provides pronunciation practice through repeating and a test with an open-ended definitional question. The entire sequence, which was two, two vocabulary concepts, five questions, five student responses, plus individual student practice and group auditing, and all the necessary behavior management to maintain attention and engagement took 45 seconds. So we, we designed this method to be efficient so that we could do interventions at uh, the clip of 15 to 20 minutes with groups of three to five students and that it would have the desired effect of teaching some defined set of items, exemplars. So we're testing them here on uh, word analysis, which is to look at a, uh, a pseudo word that has uh, no meaning, and the child is forced to, ha to do all of the phonemic processing in order to be able to pronounce it. And then word identification, which is the recognition of, of words that they actually recognize and, and know. So this is how they performed over four grades uh, on the word analysis test, which is reading these pseudo words, which is the, which is the gold standard test for being able to um, assess phonemic awareness. And uh, the, the green circle up here, uh, this represents uh, how monolinguals are expected to perform at that same grade level. And this is how they did on the uh, word identification task, which is much more related to the words that they encounter uh, randomly in class and through instruction. And again, uh, this is the level uh, where most normally achieving monolinguals would perform at that grade level. So we, we went back over the eight years using eight years of data rather than just the three years that we had. Uh, to see how, how well um, the students did over those years. And in fact, we, we, we verified that the growth path that the children took between kindergarten and first grade was as we had depicted it, that they made a big gain as they went through first grade and they got their first instruction that helped them match uh, alphabet letters to uh, sounds and to begin to decode unknown words. And then, um, they, they, they grew throughout their, the years that followed up to eighth grade with, a, with a, some uh, regress between fifth grade and sixth grade for reasons that we just don't understand. Well, these are the, these are the entire cohort of children divided into quintiles. And so the group that we actually intervened with was the bottom, the bottom performing 20%. That's, the, that's the, uh, the, this red group here. 
Um, and then you can see that you got the, the next lowest and the mid group and the high and the highest group. So these kids performed, these are the top 20% performing kids in kindergarten, and this is how they looked over the course of uh, these six years. So these are data that we did not collect, this is State of California data. So what's a little disheartening about this? We'll tell you the heartening news first. The heartening news is um, everybody improved over time. Uh, the disheartening news is that the quintiles that we identified in kindergarten never changed. So we weren't teaching them anymore. We only worked with them for a very short period of time anyhow. Uh, they were receiving a treatment, to be sure. The treatment they were receiving was education in the school, the core instruction in the school. So if you think about what the teachers are supposed to be providing the school as the treatment, the treatment was not um, mixing up the, um, the relative risk factors associated with these kids from kindergarten. And the teachers knew about these kids, and we know that for two reasons. One is that when we pick the kids, uh, especially the ones in the bottom uh, quintile, we asked the teachers to also rate all the children in their classroom based upon their overall judgment about how um, much uh, difficulty the child was having acquiring new reading skills. And the teachers' judgments about the children and our judgments based upon data were uh, overlapped about 80%. And uh, to make it even more clear, this was the decade, this decade of data here was the decade of No Child Left Behind, where schools were very specifically mandated to pay attention to the low-performing children and close the gap between those children and other children. So this school district, at least, uh, was, not, was, was markedly unsuccessful in uh, altering the risks faced by the lowest-performing kids. So the word attack skills in kindergarten were correlated with the standardized uh, English language arts uh, California state testing scores in third grade for both groups. So how well they could read words, that, pseudo words, these were pronounceable strings of letters that were not real words, uh, was correlated with how they did on the actual English language uh, uh, curriculum standards test that the state gave to the children throughout their, the five years that followed. Um, that means that the ability to do that phonemic, phonemic decoding is a critical skill and a critical predictor of how you're going to do in, in very globally in English language arts. So it's not just reading, it's listening, writing, et cetera. The development of the word attack skills from, from kindergarten to second grade, which were the years that we were working with them, were correlated with third grade um, English language arts schools, but scores, but only for the non-intervention group. So only the higher achieving kids did that relationship exist between K2 and third grade. Intervention in kindergarten was not correlated with third grade skills or later development, suggesting that the intervention did not have a long-term effect. Well, we, we never designed this with the idea that we were going to influence how they performed in eighth grade. We were really trying to make it easier for them to learn things in first grade and second grade. The variances of all the growth factors were significant, suggesting that the intra-individual differences in both initial skills and development within each of the interventions, uh, they, that everybody improved. So that was what, I what you could just visually see in the chart, that, that everybody got better, but they stayed in sort of parallel growth paths. So here you have uh, the intervention and the non-intervention groups for the first couple of years on the left side. This is until spring of their second grade year. And this is the uh, intervention group. You can see that they caught up um, by the time they were in second grade. But this is the, these are the grades after. So they lost, they lost whatever they, they were showing in, in, in terms of uh, word, word level processing here did not uh, affect at all their progress in what is really text level processing, that is comprehension and other kinds of reading activities sampled across the curriculum uh, for all those other years. So in other words, we were actively working to make the kids better. Here, here the school was doing what we would presume was trying to make the kids better, but really didn't. Well, There's just some technical data uh, about the analysis. Um, there was a lot of error, that's what this designates, is a lot of error associated with our estimates of the um, English language arts 
uh, scores, and that's because your the California English, uh, English language arts uh, standards test covers a broad range of uh, of language skills. It's not just reading and it's not just word reading. It's all kinds of reading related skills. So that 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 introduces some variation into the scores that we had that makes it more difficult for us to have confidence in the growth path that we that we estimated. Um, and here we can see that that there was there, there was in fact clearly a difference at least in those first three years between the growth paths uh, for the kids that had intervention versus the kids that did not have intervention. And uh, this, 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 these, are the, these are parameters that are simply related to the growth path between kindergarten and second grade, which you could see in the, in the graph. So the summary is, is that if you think of school as a treatment, that is the core general education instruction, short-term interventions in early grades did not produce long-term results. Well, that, those weren't expected. You have to continually work with that low achieving group of kids. You can't just inoculate them when they're kindergartners and expect that they're going to be better afterwards. And despite school awareness and a decade of policy stimulated focus on low achievement, the schools were not very effective in changing the, um, the eight year risk status of our sample. So let's go back to learning disabilities for a second and see what's happening in the states and and how and how what we're thinking about in learning disabilities is beginning to slowly slide together with how we think about English learners so these are these are uh, the identification rates in the early years and you can see that from uh, the passage of uh, the first special education law in 1975 you had this dramatic increase in the percentage of school-aged children, up above 5% of school-aged children were identified as learning disabled. But look at the last 10 years. This is from 1999 to uh, 2009. And although the percentage of children that are identified for special education has been stable, and as you all know, the percentage of children identified as having autism has increased. Now that, that may not look like a dramatic increase, but that is a dramatic increase. And during that same period of time, the percentage of children that were identified as learning disabled has dropped from its, its late 1990s high uh, down uh, almost a full percentage point. So what, what has happened that has caused those children not to be identified? And what consequences does it have for uh, kids who are English language learners? Well, what we, we learned a lot more about learning disabilities while all of this was happening. One of the things that we've learned for sure is that, that there are a number of uh, uh, perinatal events that are, uh, that are strongly uh, indicated in the likelihood of developing learning disabilities. Um, and, and maybe these are, these are disabilities that may be induced by uh, environmental events. When I say environmental events, I don't necessarily mean everything outside of your skin. I mean everything that is outside of your, your chromosome uh, constitutes an environmental event. And in this particular case, we are talking about uh, gestational events. And here you have children that are born at very low birth weight. Um, so you have uh, over 9% of children that are born at low, low birth weight have learning disabilities as compared to 4% of the population. And then the other, um, here's, here's children that have learning disabilities in ADHD, it's still a large number, but not, not quite as much, and children that have ADHD only. But in each case, the, the message is clear that, that um, whatever the gestational events are that lead to low birth weight, um, significant low birth weight, has a consequence for the emergence of later learning disabilities. In this study, um, this national study, uh, shows the percentage of children that have uh, between none and five uh, significant markers for healthcare needs um, over their, uh, their developmental period. And so this is pretty dramatic because uh, the more of these markers that you have, the more dramatically uh, learning disabilities is evidence. So this is children with no, uh, none of these uh, special health care needs, uh, and that's the, that was at that time, that was about the population rate of identification. But as you add in these other health care needs, uh, the percentage of children that are expected to have learning disabilities increases quite dramatically over their lifespan. 
same thing is true about poverty. So here you have children that are less than 100 percent of the uh, the federal poverty level, uh, even though the five percent is the national figure for special education, 14% of children who are below the federal census standard for poverty um, have learning disabilities. And as you, as you increase family income, you can see that the, the, um, the function decreases uh, predictably. So overall, the prevalence uh, uh, among 6 million children uh, for children that have um, um, learning disabilities uh, was about 9% in the, in the, uh, overall, the overall prevalence in the population. For children that has uh, significant health care needs, it was 27.8%. And for children that don't have significant health care needs, it was the population rate of 5.4%. So the system that underlies the cognitive development of um, working memory capabilities, working memory efficiencies, uh, is, part of, is part of a developmental sequence of uh, skills that are indicated by children's performance on tasks related to the manipulation of phonemes. And that, there's no reason to believe that that, that that system, that cognitive system, is any different for children that are, um, that are learning a second language. Well, we, we have now uh, brain imaging studies that we didn't have back in the early days. And uh, it helps us to sort out whether we're looking at a sociological phenomenon or a cognitive neuroscience phenomenon. This was a, a study that was done by uh, Paul Sue and uh, his colleagues uh, some years back. And uh, it, I, think it was, it, I think it's probably the most important study that was done on learning disabilities in the latter part of the 20th century. They investigated uh, individuals uh, who were adults at the time they tested them. Um, these were college students who had histories of learning disabilities in England and France. And Italy uh, tended not to identify children as learning disabled. Why? Because Italian, like Spanish, is a transparent orthography and most children learn how to read without uh, very overt difficulty. But when they tested these children uh, on those indicators which would uh, mark them as learning disabled in uh, France and the UK and the United States, they were able to identify out of a very large sample of students, they were, out, they were able to find a group of students who had profiles of performance that looked quite the same. So these are effect sizes for um, these different tests. And just let me just point out a few things like uh, there's comprehension. So this, this is the difference between, in each country, the difference between the children who are uh, um, not learning disabled, not dyslexic, and those that are. So you can see that in each of the countries, the comprehension was uh, better, but you know, just slightly better. That's in keeping with the idea that uh, they have compensatory skills that make up for their comprehension difficulties. But when you look at things like digit span, which uh, is one of the marker uh, tests for working memory, uh, huge difference uh, in performance, uh, similar with arithmetic, mental arithmetic, uh, across the three countries, despite the differences in the transparency of the orthography, and despite the difference in the identification of uh, school identification of children with dyslexia. Uh, similarly, if you look at their word reading ability, so even though the Italian kids were never picked out as kids, as children, they were never picked out as learning disabled, their performance uh, is still significantly below that of their peers in the same language group. And so word reading uh, and non-word reading, which is the, which as I mentioned earlier, was the gold standard of reading non-words that are pronounceable, uh, hugely demarcates uh, these dyslexic groups, uh, uh, English, Italian, and French-speaking groups from their peers who were not dyslexic. So this picture, what they did here was they, they took, they took uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance images of the brains, and these represent uh, sort of effect sizes, if you like. This, repre this, represents, this represents the summary of all of the non-dyslexic kids in the uh, countries across, across nationalities. 
Um, and this one represents the same kind of image for all the dyslexic kids across the three nationalities. And this one is the most interesting because this represents the subtraction of the dyslexic activation from the um, activation by the non-dyslexics across the three nationalities. So the, the sum result of this study and why it's so important was that A, this is not a sociological phenomenon. This is something that is really in the nervous systems of the, of the children. And that, um, that the same areas of the brain are implicated um, due to uh, unexpected non-activation for each of the groups of, uh, of putative dyslexic independent of the kind of language that they spoke and independent of the kind of reading system that they, the ease of the reading system that they learned in. So now we're good enough that we can now do studies where we have uh, interventions and we use the fMRI data as one of the tests of the intervention effects. So this was one of the first studies that was done that looked at both behavioral outcomes as well as um, uh, neurological outcomes. Uh, by this time, there's about 20 such studies that exist. There are not yet any studies that I'm aware of that have, that have looked similarly at children who are uh, English language learners and low achieving, and similarly low achieving children who are identified as dyslexic. So, you know, if somebody wants to be famous, go out and do that study. But this study was interesting because uh, it, 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 first of all, it replicated what we saw in the Palliser study, that it showed for the normal reader across the top, when you're looking at the left hemisphere, you're looking at uh, activation where you, where you saw it in the superior temporal lobe there, uh, just like you did in the Palliser study. And, um, and this is a particular case, but of all their cases, they had, uh, I think they had eight non-dyslexic and eight dyslexic kids. The, the pattern was very much the same. The color differences here, I think, represent the time course of the activation. So the orange is, is the later activation, and the yellow is the earlier activation. But here, here by contrast, you have the, um, the dyslexic child uh, representing a group of eight kids. Um, with very little activation uh, late in the course of response to the word reading stimuli. So they had an intervention though. So here you have the dyslexic kid before the intervention and after the intervention. So this is a teaching intervention, uh, nothing medical or neurological, just a, an instructional intervention that was geared to improve the ability to manipulate phonemes. So you notice here that the, the activation now is quite similar to that, um, even extravagant compared to that of the uh, uh, children who are not dyslexic. And another example over on this side. This is, this is kindergarten, these are the at-risk kids in kindergarten and uh, the, their, their, um, their uh, non-disabled uh, or non-at-risk peers, so that's, that's actually the same information. Oh, this was important because in, in this study, what they plotted was, I told you that the red blotches uh, showed later activation. So if you're looking just at the superior temporal lobe, which is the, the part that, that lights up the, the most, um, you can see that the, the peak activation occurs after about uh, six to 700 milliseconds uh, for the not at risk kids. For the at risk kids, there's no activation there at all, even though the, they've had plenty of time to sort of uh, process the, the, the stimulus information. This was the one I was referring to, which was the kindergarten versus first grade. So here's the, here's the kindergarten um, non-activation across the superior part of the temporal lobe, and here it is after the intervention of first grade, showing that the, the effects are actually long-lasting in nature. They're not they're not simply practice effects where the kids got better. Let me uh, sort of sum up uh, where I am with this, and uh, then I'll like to hear your thoughts and questions. If if it's true that if it's true that poverty uh, has developmental consequences for the development of language skills, and if children who are English language 
learners in the United States are disproportionately living in low-income families and therefore exposed to the same income-related risks or uh, economic-related risks, then uh, it's logical for us to presume that there is at least the possibility, the testable hypothesis, that there are uh, structural and processing difficulties that those children are experiencing uh, in the early grades in the same, uh, not only the same working memory system, but the same areas of the brain that, that subserve that working memory system. And there, that we can see that the instructional interventions that are effective with kids that have dyslexia are equally effective with the kids that are simply low performing and are putatively at risk. Um, and if that's the case, then we have every reason to believe that the intervention is influencing the same processing regions of the brain and the same underlying cognitive system. So we have difficulty, we have difficulty organizing the schools towards that, that inference. And the reason is because we want to think about children with learning, disable, uh, learning disabilities as having some kind of defective brain. And we want to think about um, children who are English learners as having no brain differences, but only differences that are related to sort of socio-cultural discrimination. So although socio-cultural discrimination may be true, and although some kind of, I wouldn't say damage in, uh, in neural pathways, but some kind of um, insufficiency in neural pathways may be true for children with learning disabilities, there are individual differences within both groups. And the, and the real test of the similarity of those differences uh, lies in the children's responsiveness to the instruction that you provide. Uh, so now that we're, we have a clear picture of how the brain is responding to the same instruction, we have a better way of knowing about uh, whether we're classifying children correctly or not. Uh, if, it wasn't, if, it wasn't, if it was not the fact that we, we classify children to receive certain services or certain kinds of resources, uh, this wouldn't be an issue. We would simply provide additional instruction for kids that didn't do well. But there's something to be learned, I think, about, um, about the underlying processes of language and the environmental circumstances beginning at conception, the environmental circumstances that affect the growth trajectories of different children. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.